So before I start, I would like to give you all a little bit of cosmic perspective, uh, going back to Cosmos and, and so on, and uh, show you this video that I really like. You may have seen it uh, on YouTube. It's very popular. It's a video that goes, um, it, it basically zooms out from, from Earth to out to uh, the, the world of uh, galaxies and the cosmology, actually. And because astronomy is the discipline that covers so such a variety of uh, such a range of um, scales, there's there's no other discipline in science that that goes that has such variety in in the scales of the objects that it studies. Um, you know, if, if you talk about a planet or you talk about a star, there's many orders of magnitude of difference in, in size. And then you talk about galaxies and it's many orders of magnitude even, even larger. Um, so it's difficult to show all of that in a linear scale. So th this video, I think does a good job. Um, what we are going to see is that as we do this zoom out, we're going to see some circles. Each circle is a factor of 10. When we see each circle um, um, sort of shrinking in, and then another circle coming in, that's a factor of 10, okay? So we go from the solar system, these are the orbits of the planets, and you see these circles. Each one is a factor of 10. So every time we see a new circle, we have gone a factor of 10 uh, farther. So we go out, uh, cross the stars, and we eventually get out of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And then as we go even further out, we see many other galaxies. But what's really remarkable is that as we zoom out more and more and more, we start to see these galaxies as almost molecules of a gas. Um, so the, the universe as a whole behaves almost as a, almost as a gas that, that you can study. And in fact, cosmologists, uh, they like to talk about the Hubble flow to refer to the large scale uh, flow of this uh, of this fluid that you can you can think the universe as a fluid made out of galaxies. These are the topics covered in astronomy in general. When we talk about astronomy nowadays, this is what we would be uh, talking about from the closest star, which is the sun. Uh, actually, I could have included here the moon, but the, the moon we would have it under the solar system. Um, up to other planets and then stars and, and interstellar medium and then the galaxies and cosmology. Um, and then these are what I call the super problems. Uh, of course, each discipline has its own problems and they're all fascinating. But these three are sort of like the, the big problems of, I wouldn't say not just astronomy, but science in general for the 21st century. Extraterrestrial life, that is a big question that we've always had. It not only affects astronomy, but it also involves biology and many other disciplines. Um, and then two discoveries made by astronomy that are relevant for physics as a whole are dark matter and dark energy. What are they? We have no idea. So I think if we want to hook students into science, we have to teach them what we know, but we also have to tell them that we don't know everything, that there are still big questions and big mysteries that need to be solved by the scientists of the future. And they are going to be those scientists of the future who will be working on these problems and perhaps they will be solving them um, in, the, in the 21st century. Well, in my, in my talk, because astronomy is so big, uh, I'm going to focus on, on the, the closer part, um, sun, solar system and exoplanets, and the big problem, the, the super problem of extraterrestrial life. Um, that's what I will be discussing here. And uh, let me start with the sun. And uh, one of the main problems that we have with the sun is the activity. Um, the sun is not, it, not just a very hot uh, ball of plasma. Um, it also has features like this that we can see even with amateur telescopes. Um, but especially now that we have satellites that monitor the sun at different wavelengths, 24 hours a day, um, we can see very clearly these, these features. And this is very important because it affects what we call space weather. Um, it's the whole space environment of Earth, which is more and more important to us uh, every day because we have satellites, 
because we have astronauts in the International Space Station, uh, and because we depend on, um, we have electronic technology that depends on what's going on in the magnetosphere around Earth. If it's perturbed, then that can uh, cause damages to our uh, power infrastructure and our electronic devices. So, so this is very important. And one classic problem when uh, uh, studying solar physics is what we call coronal heating, which is the corona is the region around the sun that we normally, we cannot see it um, from Earth unless there's an eclipse because the corona is much fainter than the disk. So we are overwhelmed by the light from the disk and we cannot see the corona. But if there's a solar eclipse, because the moon covers the solar disk, then we can see what's around. And what's around is the corona. Um, it can be seen from space uh, more easily now we, that we have satellites. And a very disturbing discovery in the 19th century is that the solar corona is extremely hot. It can be up to a million degree hot. And for a long time, this was a mystery. Now we understand that some of it, not all of it. We understand that the corona is so hot because somehow the solar magnetic field and this activity is heating up the corona, but we don't know exactly how that is happening. So that's one of the current problems in solar physics. Um, the sun, when we look at it with these satellites, this is a time lapse, so it's, uh, it's accelerated. We can see these phenomena. Um, these are flares, which are these sudden brightenings where there's like an explosion in the sun. And we can see the earth in these images. We can always see the earth at a scale, just to give you, to give us an idea of how big, how colossal these explosions are. Now, th thankfully, we are much farther away from the sun. Uh, we don't get burned by these explosions. But these eruptions um, can sometimes throw uh, solar material out into space. Uh, and that material moves at thousands of kilometers per second. And it becomes almost like a, like a projectile that uh, can disturb the, the Earth space environment. And it can create uh, disturbances in the space weather. And that's why it's, uh, it's interesting to study. I, I make this comparison here that each one of these eruptions releases an amount of energy equivalent to millions of hydrogen bombs, uh, just to give an idea of how powerful these um, explosions are. We sometimes call them solar storms when they can affect uh, the conditions around Earth. And this can have effects on our planet. Now, we have to remember that the, um, the Earth is protected by a magnetosphere. The Earth has a magnetic field. And this magnetic field is like a bubble that shields the Earth from these, um, from, from these particles that flow from the sun. There's a solar wind that is constantly flowing. And there's these eruptions that occasionally throw like a, a you know, like a big bullet of, uh, of solar plasma in our direction. Now, this plasma is captured by the magnetic field around Earth, which um, directs it away. And um, it uh, channels these particles um, and it makes them move uh, to, the, to the poles, the Earth poles. So um, the effects of these um, storms on Earth, they typically occur in the outer space where this magnetic protection is not so effective or on high latitudes. Countries at higher latitudes are more at risk of being affected by solar events than at lower latitudes near the equator. And that's because what I said, the, the Earth magnetic field goes from North Pole to South Pole. Actually, it's the other way around, but anyway. Um, and, and so the Earth magnetic field re, re, redirects these particles to the poles. So the closer you are to the poles, the more you are affected by it. So there are some effects. Um, we don't have to sort of be afraid of a, you know, an apocalypse. It's not 
like the sun is going to burn us or anything like that. But uh, there are some possible impacts, like we can have, um, there's risk to the health of the astronauts because they are uh, in space, they are exposed to this uh, radiation. These are energetic particles that, um, that move through space. They can go through the walls of the space station and they go into the bodies of the astronauts. And this is like, this is like being subject to radioactivity. So eventually, if, if you're exposed to sufficiently high dose of radiation, you are at risk of developing cancer. Um, so that is a, a problem that they have to, to take into account. Um, they can damage satellites. Uh, they can produce aurora, which are beautiful displays of light. So that we like that. Overall, there's a, an increase in the natural level of uh, radioactivity that we experience. So we, we have, uh, we, radioactivity is not something artificial. Uh, it exists in nature and there's like a basal level, um, a low level of radioactivity that we coexist with uh, on a daily basis. And so these solar events will increase uh, temporarily that level of radioactivity. There's interferences in radio communications, and it can uh, affect even the schedule of, uh, of flights, uh, circumpolar flights, and flights that, um, that, that go through high latitude, mainly because of two effects, mainly because of the effects of radiation uh, on, the, on the airplane, but also because of possible radio interferences. So sometimes airlines, they have to re redirect their flights um, to avoid um, going through higher latitudes. And then we have problems with the GPS and general, general communications because um, this flow of charged particles from the sun, it can disrupt the ionosphere of the earth. The ionosphere is a layer of the atmosphere where um, it's exposed to solar radiation and, and so, um, the well, it, it's an it's a layer where we have electrically charged atoms, and what happens is that the GPS signal uh, it it undergoes delays when it goes through those layers, so it it becomes inaccurate. Um, I'm seeing a question in the chat asking if the astronauts are only exposed during spacewalks or only when they are inside the station. They are also exposed when they are inside the station because. These particles can move through uh, through the walls uh, of the space station. They can they can go through a thin metal plate without uh, much problem. You will need to have a very thick shield of a, a very uh, dense metal in order to to stop these particles. But of course, that will make the station too heavy. So when you send something to space, you try to make them as light as possible. So only there's a there's a compartment that has this shielding. And so when, when there's an event, astronauts are advised to move into this enclosed uh, shielded space to be more protected. Um, and this, all this uh, activity, um, I'm not going to go into the details, but it's related to the uh, magnetic fields uh, that are produced by the sun um, the sun is made out of plasma, and this plasma is uh, subject to, to motions, and that generates a magnetic field, and the magnetic field interacts with the electric charge in the, the atoms that compose the plasma, and that creates all of these uh, phenomena. We don't, understand, uh, we don't understand these interactions very well. We only understand the basic physics, but not the, uh, not the whole thing. And this... Um, activity that we have on the sun also we now know that it also takes place in other stars and we are starting to observe in fact very violent activity in other stars and this could be related to the problem of extraterrestrial life because if this is happening in the sun and we know that other stars have thousands of times more energetic activity then this could be a problem for life to emerge on other planets around these very active stars. So it's something that people are starting to, um, to think about when, when thinking about uh, extraterrestrial life. Um, I, I have to mention the European Solar Telescope, which is a project 
that uh, our institute, the, the IAC, is leading to build a uh, next generation uh, solar telescope uh, on the Canary Islands. And um, this is going to be a, well, this is a European project with many countries involved. Um, and it's very important because we, we have other large uh, telescopes in our observatories, but we don't have many large telescopes that have been uh, designed and built mostly by our institute and by Spanish uh, institutions and, and companies. So, so for that reason, this is a very exciting project for us. It's a project that, uh, that the Institute has been leading since the inception, and, and we hope that it will be uh, built um, in the, uh, and, and be working uh, in the next decade. There are other projects uh, for, for solar physics. The other large uh, telescope is being built in Hawaii, in the US, it's the DKIST. And then there are solar uh, probes like uh, the NASA Parker Solar Probe, which was launched two years ago, and Solar Orbiter uh, launched last year, the European probe. So um, there's more and more interest in studying solar activity, and, and that's why both um, ground-based telescopes and space agencies are building these instrumentation. Um, let's move now to the solar system in general, the, which is here we have uh, mostly uh, studies, uh, actually this slide got cut, but anyway, uh, we'll go through everything, don't worry. Um, we have minor bodies. Minor bodies are comets, asteroids, um, everything that's smaller than a planet. And um, they are very important because they, they are fossils. They tell us about the origin of the solar system and even our own planet. Um, because for instance, think that the, most of the uh, metals that we extract from the earth crust, uh, particularly um, metals like uh, gold, um, were brought to earth uh, by meteorites. They, the original, these heavy elements uh, that were on Earth originally have been sinking because of uh, gravity when the Earth was completely liquid at the beginning. Um, they, they have been sinking to the interior. So the, the Earth uh, crust was made mostly of rock. Um, there's been lots of meteorites that have been bringing these, these elements. But most importantly, the water. Uh, the Earth at the beginning was basically, a, uh, the surface was molted, uh, it was lava, uh, because the planet was still very hot. And uh, after, after it formed, it took um, a few hundreds of millions of years to cool down, to have a solid surface. Um, so uh, the, by the time it developed a solid surface, it had no water on the surface. The, the water that we have now on Earth, all the oceans and all the water that we have on the surface came to Earth um, on um, meteorites and comets. And in fact, there was a study from last year that revealed exactly the type of uh, asteroid that brought the, the water that makes up the oceans on Earth. Um, so, we are we're making progress on understanding where you know the water and all the materials that we have on earth came from so from that point of view they're they're very interesting um i have here the apocalypse is, is very spectacular but it, it is true that you know there is a danger that um, our civilization will have to uh, eventually face a big tragedy because Sooner or later, a large meteorite is going to hit the Earth. Um, we, you know, we have the example of the dinosaurs that became extinct because a kilometer-sized meteorite impacted Earth about 66 million years ago, and that created a big change on the planet uh, that made it impossible for the large uh, dinosaurs to to survive on it, and and it uh, it made life evolve in different in, in different directions um, because the, the whole environment changed um, for thousands of years after the impact. And um, 
but you know one doesn't have to be so dramatic there's um, um, small meteorite impacts all the time uh, small meteorites are hitting earth every day and you know every few years we have an impact that is um, that can be dangerous for a large amount of people uh, we had in 2013 the famous Chelyabinsk meteorite which uh, um, uh, resulted in thousands of people injured and this meteorite didn't didn't hit the ground it exploded in the air but the shock wave that it produced um, that's what uh, created most of the injuries it's not very likely that a big meteorite is going to fall in a populated area. Uh, I think only 3% of the Earth's surface is, is populated by humans, but you know it can happen um, and it's only a matter of time. So we need, and this is something that has been um, in, the, in the last few years, there's many projects that are being developed with new instrumentation especially the Vera Rubin Observatory, which will start working next year, um, will be a big step forward to, um, to build a catalog of all the potentially dangerous objects that are out there. We think that we only know about 30% of the dangerous uh, asteroids. So we want to have a big catalog where we have, you know, as high a percentage as possible of these objects catalog measure and with their trajectories detailed, uh, observed in detail. Because this is very important. We think that we are starting to have the technology to prevent an impact, but we have to know with uh, a lot of time in advance, many decades in advance uh, of that impact. And for that, we need to know in detail the trajectory of these objects. There is a, a space mission that will be launched um, in later this year, in November, if I remember correctly, is called uh, DART, um, Double Asteroid Redirect Test. And what this, this mission is going to do is uh, go to an asteroid and give it a nudge, uh, give it a little push to see if we are able to, to give it the right uh, amount of push to, to, to um, sort of deviate its trajectory uh, just enough to prevent an impact. Um, so we, we are about to have that technology, but it's not like in the movies. We cannot do it like, you know, two months in advance. We have to know several decades in advance because we can only give it a small push. So it has to be sufficiently early that this push will deviate the trajectory enough that it will not collide with Earth. Um, so for that reason, it's critical to have the information. We need to have a detailed and precise knowledge of all the trajectories of all these objects. And by the way, blowing up an asteroid like they do in the movies, that's not a good idea. It only makes it worse because what you're going to do is you're going to take a big rock that goes in a trajectory to collide at a certain location. You're going to turn it into many, many rocks uh, that will spread the collision energy over a much larger area. Um, and that's worse. You're going to kill more people if you spread the damage over a larger area that if all the damage is concentrated in one impact. Um, so that is not a good idea. Um, they, what, we, what we need to do is push an asteroid and make sure we deviate it. We don't want to break it down. Um, another thing that's very important right now is this mission that NASA has. It's called Artemis to go back to the moon. Um, I'm seeing a question in the chat about whether the, the asteroid of 2015 was predicted. The answer is no. This uh, we did know about. We didn't know about this asteroid. We didn't see it coming because it was coming from the from the day side, and we don't have um, telescopes that look at the whole sky all the time to catch uh, all these objects. So this one was not cataloged, and this is a perfect example of why we need these surveys where we are looking at all the sky all the time both from the ground and from space, because from the ground, we can only see half of the sky. We can only see the night sky. Um, from space, we can also see um, most of the day sky. Um, so that's why it's important. This is a picture of what, a, what when we thought of a comet 10 years ago. This is what we, the, the idea that we had of a comet 10 years ago. Now we've landed on a comet and we, oops, here it is. 
And this is what a comet looks like now. This is a churyumov gerasimenko 67 p uh, comet that was visited by the European Space Agency uh, Rosetta mission. And it even landed um, a device, uh, a, a probe on this comet. So this is very, very impressive, um, these uh, images and how we can now, we can actually ride a comet. Um, if you think about it, it's just, it's mind blowing. Um, I was saying that NASA wants to get back to the moon. That's going to cost a lot of money, uh, but apparently the White House wants to do that. When I say go back to the moon, I mean send people back to the moon. And um, um, I don't know if that is justified from a scientific point of view. Mm, there are some reasons to do it. Um, but I don't know if the amount of money it's going to cost uh, could be used better for other um, things. I don't know. But, but these things are complicated but it's because it's not like this money could you could take it out of there and put it somewhere else. Probably if you don't advertise that you're going back to the moon, then you wouldn't get that money anyway. So I don't know. Uh, it, it's a complicated business. But anyway, NASA wants to do that. Um, they want to do it soon, within five years. And... Um, it's, it's likely that the first person on the moon this time will be a woman. And the program is called Artemis, which is the, um, it's a very good uh, name because uh, it's, um, Artemis is the Greek goddess of the moon and she's the sister of Apollo. So the, the first uh, program to, to get to the moon was called Apollo. So now um, Apollo's sister is, is the one who is going, is going back to land on the moon. Um, so that's going to be a big part of the space exploration in the next few years, and, and it's going to be a big part of uh, where NASA is going to put its resources. Um, planets, they, this is no doubt the, the most, um, the most uh, pressing issue that we have now in astronomy. We, we have these um, first um, uh, days of space exploration in the 70s and the 80s where we started sending probes to the planets and we discovered many things and then we haven't been sending so many uh, and now it's picking up again and we've been sending lots of missions to Mars and, and Mars is becoming very very fascinating. We have now something we don't understand which is what we call the methane mystery um, and uh, I, will, I will talk a, a little bit about it later. But um, it's, um, you know, Mars is, is very attractive from the point of view of astrobiology because it's a potential place where there could be or there could have been life in the, in the past and we want to search for that. But also Venus has become very important and um, a lot of people now are thinking about going back to Venus, even though its surface is so hostile. Uh, but, but we know that the upper atmosphere uh, could be benign for life and also because the history the geological history of venus is, is very interesting somehow we now know that a billion years ago venus was a habitable planet with oceans and liquid water and then something happened that we don't understand um, it, it, it had this runaway greenhouse effect that i mentioned in my earlier in my earlier talk and all the water evaporated and um, and the planet became um, uninhabitable with surface temperatures of 400 degrees and pressures of 90 atmospheres. So we don't understand what happened. Probably there was like a, a big um, burst of uh, volcanic activity that threw gigantic amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere and changed everything. So what we are starting to see that is that planets can change abruptly, um, very, very radically. And, and that, that's an important message that we have to take. And it's an important lesson, lesson to learn uh, also when we think about our own planet. We shouldn't take for granted that, you know, our paradise is always going to be like a paradise. Um, and then there's, there's uh, the outer solar system, which um, is also becoming very interesting because of what we are learning about, especially about the moons of the, of the giant planets. Um, let me show you, uh, I should have mentioned this when I talked about the asteroids. We have now missions that 
have gone out to asteroids and picked up samples to bring them back to Earth. And this video, I would like to show it. This is from the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission. Um, this is a video of the mission touching down on the asteroid, blowing up some air to throw dust in the air and be able to pick up samples. These samples have been collected in a cylinder and that cylinder has been uh, thrown back to Earth where um, it will be analyzed um, in a laboratory. Um, let me start with Mars because we've had a fascination uh, by Mars. I would say it started in the 19th century. In fact, when we talk about aliens, we always say little Martians or something like that. It's even popular culture that we have this, we've had this idea that Mars is a planet that could be inhabited. And I think this started with the works of Percival Lowell, uh, who was a very interesting character um, in, the, in the US. He, he was a millionaire uh, and um, uh, diplomat and, and uh, entrepreneur. And he was also an astronomer. Um, the astronomy was his passion. So he, he built uh, his own observatory in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. And from that observatory, he was mostly interested in Mars. Um, although he, he also did some other interesting works. For instance, he was uh, very important for the discovery of, of Pluto. But um, he, he did observe Mars and uh, he was convinced that he could see signs of, of a civilization on Mars with his telescope. Now, we know now that he was wrong, um, but, um, and actually the, the scientific community at the time did not agree with his ideas, but uh, he was a very, a very good science popularizer also. And he, um, well, his ideas were, um, were very popular among the public and the journalists. Well, of course, uh, this, this still happens today. If you have uh, one scientist saying, oh, I believe there's aliens, uh, I believe this, uh, I believe Oumuamua is an alien spaceship, just one scientist, then all of the media um, everywhere in the world, they, they pick that up. Whereas the rest of the scientific community saying, no, come on, it's an asteroid, then uh, that, you know, that doesn't receive the same attention. So the same happened in the 19th century. Um, all the scientists were saying, no, there's no evidence of civilization on Mars, but uh, people paid more attention to what Percival Lowell was saying. Anyway, um, the, the work uh, of, um, of Lowell was uh, also inspired by Giovanni Schiaparelli's observations of Mars. Um, Schiaparelli thought that there was a network of canali uh, on the Martian surface. And um, the idea that sort of was perceived by, by the public was that this canal could be a, the engineering of, a, of an old civilization that was getting dry because Mars was red. So red looks, the red color to us um, sort of uh, suggests a very dry, desertic place. So they, they thought that um, perhaps this was a dying planet that was getting dry and they were using this canal to bring water from the poles to the um, lower latitudes where these creatures live. And then um, in the last years of the 19th century, there was the, uh, the novel by H.G. Wells, uh, the, the War of the Worlds. That was the first science fiction novel. It was a huge success. It was the first science fiction novel to portrayed a war between uh, humans and another civilization. And it's, it's a great story. It's uh, an absolutely beautiful uh, story. Even you can still read it today and it's, uh, it's, it's very, very fun to read. It was a huge success. And then it became even more popular um, in the 1930s because of the, the radio broadcast of uh, Orson Welles the, before uh, being the famous uh, movie director, he, he was a, a radio um, uh, journalist and he made a, a, serialization, a novelization, I don't know what you call that. Um, he, he made a dramatization of the novel in the radio in such a way that it was presented as a real thing. 
And, and a lot of people at the time, they believed that it was actually going on. They were listening to the radio and listening to this uh, story about aliens invading Earth, the Martians invading Earth. And a lot of people panicked. And, and um, you know, this was, um, yeah, this was an interesting sociological experiment. But anyway, the, the idea that Mars was a world with people on it uh, became very popular in the 19th century and the early 20th century. I think that was what uh, inspired all this fascination by Mars. But then came the disappointment. When we started sending probes there, first the, the Mariner missions, um, and then the, the landings uh, of the Viking missions. I mentioned earlier that Carl Sagan was very involved in, in the Viking missions. And we landed on Mars and we learned lots of things, but um, mostly that was pretty much a desert. There was no civilizations, there were no canali, no signs of engineering, um, no animals running around. It was it was pretty much a a place, a place that looked like Earth. It looked like a desert from Earth. Um, Sagan says in Cosmos that he was amazed when looking at these pictures of how similar they look, they, they look like a real place. Uh, he said that I've seen places like this in, in Arizona or Colorado. So Mars looks like a place, uh, a place that you can, you can go and you can be there. Um, but anyway, uh, that's when, at that time, we had this uh, disappointment and we thought that, well, Mars is dead, Venus is dead, and we started pretty much ruling out that life could exist in the solar system. I think in the 90s, when I studied, if you asked any astronomer about the possibility of life in the solar system, they would go, no, that's crazy, it's impossible. Uh, however, things are changing now. Uh, now there's a new fascination with Mars. And the reason is that we have discovered now that that has not been always the case. Um, during a period of about a billion years, uh, in, in the early days of, of Mars, it was warm, uh, it had uh, a dense atmosphere, and it had oceans and lakes and rivers. We, we have seen geological evidence of tsunamis. Um, we, we, um, we have a mission now that's uh, driving a rover around the, an ancient, uh, ancient dry lake, and it will drive uh, up the, the, the riverbed. So Mars was a very hospitable place 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, plus we have learned that the reason why everything changed is because of the solar activity. I remember I mentioned earlier that it was very important for habitability. We, Mars does not have the magnetic field that the earth has. And so without that protection, um, this is a very recent discovery from two years ago. Um, without that protection, the solar wind and the solar storms ripped uh, apart the, the, sol the Martian atmosphere. And without an atmosphere, all the water evaporated. And that's how it became the dry desert that it is today. However, we're seeing very intriguing things. Um, this is a controversy that is still going on. The Curiosity rover uh, had an instrument to analyze the chemical composition of the atmosphere. Well, it has detected uh, spikes in the concentration of methane. Methane is a gas that is very interesting for astrobiology because uh, on Earth, 80% of the methane is produced by living organisms. So we don't know what's creating this methane in Mars. It could be geological processes. We know that you don't necessarily require life to produce methane. There are ways you can, you can have it uh, produced by geochemical reactions, but we don't know what is creating it on Mars. And besides, there was a controversy early on because other missions like the trace gas orbiter from the uh, European Space Mission did not detect methane on the Earth, on the, on the Mars atmosphere. So there was some controversy between the Curiosity NASA group and the uh, TGO uh, European uh, Space Agency group they were arguing about this problem. Um, and at first it was like a discussion. It was like an argument between NASA and ESA until uh, later on, the, also the European Mars Express mission confirmed that it was detecting methane near the region where uh, Curiosity is. Um, 
So then at some point it became clear that some methane emission exists, but then it gets destroyed before it can populate the atmosphere. So something is going on with the methane that we don't understand. And of course, that opens the door that there could be some microorganisms that are either creating or destroying the methane or something is going on, or maybe not. Maybe it could be something completely different, but it is a very intriguing problem that we have right now. And I think it's very interesting. Uh, the, you probably heard a few months ago, the Perseverance mission landed on Mars. And this is very exciting because this is the first mission whose main priority is to search for present or past life on another planet. Um, figured out where he is. This is a video of the landing of the Perseverance. And it is very, very impressive. Actually, it's very similar to the landing of Curiosity. Um, but this is a mission that is going to look for evidence of life, thinking that perhaps the, as I mentioned, Mars um, 3.5 billion years ago was a very hospitable planet. So life could have uh, emerged then. And Perseverance is looking for that. Whether we find it or we don't find it is going to be a very interesting, um, a very interesting piece of information. Because if, if we find it, I mean, that would be amazing. But if we don't find it, then we would have to ask why a planet that is so similar, that was so similar to Earth, did not develop life where, when Earth did. Uh, because at that time, there was life already on Earth. Life on Earth emerged after at least 400 million years. Uh, we have evidence of life at 400, 500 million years on Earth and indications that even earlier than that perhaps was there. So very quickly, as soon as the planet cooled down, uh, there was life on Earth. So if there was not life on Mars, then it will be interesting to know why, what is the difference? What was the difference back then? And then another fascinating problem uh, for astrobiology is uh, the moons of giant planets, especially Europa and Enceladus. And the reason is that uh, Europa is this moon of Jupiter and Enceladus is a similar moon around uh, Saturn. The reason why they are so exciting is because, well, these moons are covered by ice. Uh, they are completely covered by a crust of several kilometers of ice. But what's really interesting is that now we know that below those kilometers of ice, there's an ocean. We know that there's a, an ocean of liquid, liquid water. And at the base of that, uh, of that ocean, there is a, a rock uh, bottom. There is a solid bedrock with um, thermal vents. And that's a perfect place for life to emerge. Um, there's plenty of life on Earth in similar environments. Um, and we also know that the composition of that ocean is very similar to the composition of the oceans on Earth. It's just salty water. Um, it's very exciting because the Cassini spacecraft uh, flew over the uh, Enceladus, um, uh, over the, the moon Enceladus. And you know, we know that both Europa and Enceladus have these plumes of uh, vapor that come out of it. Sometimes these, these hot uh, vents they, they create something like a like geysers, uh, plumes of vapor, water vapor that comes out of cra uh, cracks in the ice, and and they can go up hundreds of kilometers into space, and the Cassini spacecraft flew through some of those plumes, so it was able to measure the composition of that uh, vapor, and that's how we know that it it is salty water similar to the one on Earth, but also it found very complex organic molecules, as complex as it was able to measure, which is about, if I remember correctly, 40 or 50 carbon atoms. Uh, carbon atoms. So we know there's complex organic chemistry going on in these oceans. Um, so there's all the ingredients for life out there. So both Europa and Enceladus are very promising um, targets to, to search for, uh, for life. Now it's going to be very difficult to reach that because they are underneath uh, kilometers of ice. You cannot drill that, uh, but we can analyze the composition of these plumes and see what they can tell us about what, what's going on in the interior. That's, that's extremely exciting. And then Titan, 
I didn't mention it. Titan is a moon of Saturn, which has is the only moon that we know in the solar system that has a thick atmosphere, and it has an atmosphere of methane. And there's lakes of liquid methane on Titan. So it's a completely different ecosystem, but perhaps methane could act, uh, could play the role of water on Earth and have some form of life using this liquid methane in, instead of water for us. But also there's a similar situation with Titan that we now know it has an undersurface ocean and of water. And again, this, this subsurface ocean could also be a promising uh, target to search for life. So there's, there's plenty of very exciting things to look at um, and to search for life. Um, these are the papers I mentioned about. Uh, this is from 2018, where the Cassini spacecraft found this macromolecular organic compound um, in, the, in these plumes uh, of Enceladus. And uh, this is a recent paper from, from June, uh, so about a, a month ago, where this is one of the papers where they try to make sense of the chemical composition measured by, um, measured by the Cassini spacecraft. In particular, they look here at the methane. Uh, Cassini found very high concentrations of methane in those plumes. And what this paper says and others before it is that we do not understand how you can have so much methane in these plumes. Um, unless you invoke, um, so let me put it this way. With the, with the chemistry that we know, uh, chemistry that we've learned from Earth, if you leave out the possibility of life, uh, we do not understand why there is so much methane in these plumes. So there could be new chemistry that we are not aware of, uh, or there could be some form of life uh, producing that methane in, in Enceladus. So that, that's very, both uh, possibilities are very exciting, of course. Um, we are starting to detect interstellar objects. Uh, we're starting to have the capability to do that. We, um, in 2018, we detected the first uh, clear um, obvious interstellar object, which, which was uh, Oumuamua. And then in 2019, we detected the Borisov comet. And these are the first two um, undoubtedly um, objects that come from outside the solar system. But in the, in the next few years, we're going to probably we're going to detect many more. And I'm going to conclude talking a little bit about exoplanets. And I'm not going to go into much detail, except that we are detecting more and more of them. Uh, we are launching new space missions to detect new exoplanets. Um, right now, we know of 4,000, and this keeps increasing all the time. And what's really exciting is that we're building these super telescopes. Um, this the James Webb Space Telescope will be launched um, in October if everything goes well. And then we have these three giant telescopes on, on the ground that hopefully will be built uh, within the next 10, 15 years. And what's really amazing is that with these telescopes, we will be able to analyze the chemical composition of the atmospheres of these exoplanets. And with that information, we can look for biosignatures, biomarkers. So there's some um, molecules that if we find them on the next, uh, in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, then we can be sure that there is life there. And with so many targets to search for, many people think that this is something that will happen soon, that we will be able to find biosignatures in some exoplanet within the next, I don't know, 10, 15 years. So that's extremely exciting. And so um, I'm going to skip this and go right to the conclusions. This, this was just to highlight that activity um, to connect with the beginning. It's very important, the activity of the star to the uh, possible habitability of the planet. But anyway, I think the, the message I wanted to send, to send is that these are fascinating times because there are very, there's very profound questions that, that we have now and, and might be solved within our lifetime. Um, life, uh, extraterrestrial life is a very important problem, not only for astrophysics, but also for biology. And, and it also has very profound social and philosophical implications 
And this is a question that we can uh, perhaps um, answer within our lifetime. And, and then there's the possibility of new physics uh, in the discoveries of dark matter and dark energy. And so these are all great mysteries of science that perhaps the, the future scientists, the, the young people who are studying now, they, they might become interested in them and they might be the pioneers of the, the, the studies that will solve these questions. And I think that's, that, you know, that's a very exciting perspective for any aspiring young scientist. Thank you.